Welcome to the 9 a.m. talk on Faust in the Classroom. My name is Julia Smith and I'm from Karma and I want to talk about how I use Faust in my teaching. So I use it three ways primarily. The students are at the master's level typically, a few undergrads, a few PhDs, but mostly it's master's students and they have some computer science background um, mostly they're there to learn about music technology, uh, particularly uh, signal processing. So the first use that's most commonly um, first seen by the uh, students is the real-time audio signal processing demonstrations. So the idea there is to just introduce a topic by giving a demo and letting them hear it and operate the controls in real time. Um, it's just to set the stage. Uh, this usually affects that they already know about and uh, we're just fixing ideas for the discussion. Then the uh, second use is in live coding. So most of the live coding is in MATLAB and it's a really great use of the uh, flipped classroom where students have presumably read the assigned reading, they have looked at the uh, video lectures from previous years that were recorded where I really went through all the material in great detail and in this case the classroom is really freed up to do whatever we want to do and, and my discovery is that live coding seems to be one of the most engaging things that we do in terms of uh, student participation and attention levels and so on. So Faust is a very nice live coding language because it's very high level, very compact, and it's very plausible. When you write it in a way that's very readable, then uh, the students really get it and uh, it, it, it introduces them to Faust and gets them, gets them going in that direction and uh, good things come out of that. And then the final use is uh, just a, a, a library of, of reference implementation. So it's, it's a language in which one can uh, implement the standard algorithms, uh, the best known algorithms for various situations, and put them in a library that people can then easily access for their project work in the class or maybe uh, after they graduate when they're at some, uh, they, they have some assignment at work and they need to get something going. Uh, very often that's in C++ and they can just compile from Faust to C++ and uh, snip it out and put it wherever it goes. So it's a, it's a useful repository for you know, best practices as far as we know. So since I believe I'm the first person to be talking about Faust according to the program uh, today, I know Yan and Romain will be talking about it later. Um, I will uh, give you a first introduction. Um, FAUST is an acronym for Functional Audio Stream, and so that means it's a functional programming language that uh, regards um, audio as a first-class object. Really, it's, it's block diagrams that are, that are first-class objects, and these um, block diagrams compute uh, on streams of audio. So you can now also specify your graphical user interface, or GUI, and so the sliders and, and, and so on are very useful. Uh, so it's really wonderful for specifying a complete program that is usable right away uh, when compiled and executed in some environment. But And there are very many environments it can be compiled for. So it compiles to C++, but also to LLVM, JavaScript, uh, even just plain C. And so it's a, it's a very nice um, set of uh, back-end languages available. And then to get to the various platform environments, there's this notion of architecture files, which encapsulate the platform-specific API, the application programming interface. It is a way of, um, so, you, so you basically write an example of, of the program that you want with little hooks that say where the, you know, the initialization goes, where the, you know, um, signal processing goes, and, and where the GUI elements um, you know, need to be created and, and populated. And so you simply write the, uh, the back end that the uh, compiler uh, finds the hooks uh, for, and uh, it's called the architecture file. And, it's, and it really widens the immediate portability of everything. So let's take a look. Uh, I like to introduce it using the uh, Faust Online Compiler. And so here is what it looks like when you get there. You've got this very simple program. Uh, which is a one-character program, you might say. Um, it's a function definition defining the function process to be plus. So process is a special function that's got to be there, and it is your main uh, 
uh, high level function. So that's your main block diagram. And so it will then be defined typically in terms of other functions. And those functions are defined somewhere else. They can be before or after statement order can be arbitrary here. And uh, when it all expands out, you've got a block diagram. And that block diagram specifies how the inputs are processed to form the outputs. So plus is a predefined special block diagram that means add two inputs to produce an output. And so one of the great features of Faust is the ability to generate a block diagram from the, uh, the high-level language. And here is what we get for the plus uh, block diagram. So process is plus two inputs, one output. And I find that when working with Faust, I generally just have to look at this. In other words, I write the code, make sure uh, the syntax is clean and that it compiles. And once it compiles, it tends to simply work. So if the, block, if, the, if the block diagram looks right, it tends to work. So in other words, debugging is just looking at the diagram uh, most of the time. So another thing I will do in class is show the compiled code. And so this is an example of what comes out um, if you've specified uh, a particular application. It's better to start perhaps with none here. That's just my last example I had. So I'm asking for the C++ language, uh, but I could also have these choices here. Um, and I'm specifying the Linux platform, but I could also choose Windows, OS X, Raspberry, Android, ROS, and Web. And so under Linux, you see I've got quite a few choices here. And uh, let's not uh, get into them right at the moment, but there are a lot of standalone programs and a lot of plugin types. Uh, the ones I use most commonly are the Jack uh, standalone programs. Uh, I prefer Qt, but you can also use the GNU Toolkit. Uh, those are just alternative high-level uh, you know, window systems. And then for plugins, um, I like to use LV2. Uh, thanks to Albert Graff, who I suspect is in the audience. Thank you very much for the, for the LV2 support. And we also have uh, the ability to generate plots for MATLAB, so you can inspect signals. Uh, we can go straight to, to Pure, also by Albert. And we also can uh, go to PD plugins, Pure Data, and Super Collider. Uh, plugins and so-called chugins for Chuck and so on, C sound even. So it's a it's a very rich set of uh, output possibilities. And so if you have OSC support in your architecture file, you can check it here, and then you can also generate an executable in the um, current uh, chosen uh, architecture. So let's look at a little bit at this code. So this is the C++ generated from the Faust program process equals plus. And here is uh, some uh, definitions at the beginning. So we get a class, and it's the DSP class. <clears throat> and you uh, have the variables you need here, the sampling frequency that you're running at. This metadata is for all the various labels and paths to your GUIs, your, your graphical user interface elements. You can ask this class, how many inputs does it have? How many outputs does it have? So it's uh, two and one, respectively. You can ask about sampling rates and so on. Um, and now, the real, well, there are initialization methods, you know, you can initiate the instance the, uh, um, or, or the class, so, and you can also build up the user interface. In this case, there's no user interface, so there's nothing going on in here. So the, here's the uh, heart of it. It's the compute loop, and this is the heart of the signal processing, I should say. And so to the arguments to the compute function are the buffer size, typically 64 samples, and that's your audio buffer size, typically. And then you have an array of inputs and an array of outputs. And those are your uh, input and output signals. And so our simple example uh, has this inner loop. So it's a loop over all samples to just add the two inputs to produce the output. So this is your basic stereo to mono converter. And so it's very nice to um, get an orientation into how we're specifying Low-level code in such a in such a nice high-level form. Okay, that was an introduction to the Faust language and how we use it um, as an introduction to the language. And so now, let's talk a little bit about the in-class demonstrations. So use these to introduce a topic and just establish the setting and, and generate motivation, just you know, talk about things that people generally know about. You know, they know about most of these effects and spectrum analysis and so on. And so we, uh, we demonstrate it and show them some you know, live code for doing it. 
and then dive into how they work and how to build them in a bottom-up fashion. So the ones I use most often are the standalone Qt applications generated directly from Faust using the architecture file um, uh, Jack uh, for Qt and Jack for Core Audio. And so I'll typically start out with some of these demos on the first day uh, to talk about all the various things we're going to learn. And then also whenever starting a new topic, it's good to you know, start, uh, do a demo for kicking it off or at the end to, to see it in action. So the demos add practical utility and motivation uh, to the class. Okay, here is a demonstration of the filter bank being used as a spectrum analyzer. So we have a constant Q spectrum analyzer made using a filter bank. And you see we have 20 bands spanning uh, from a DC channel, low pass, 9 octaves below 16 kilohertz, and then a high pass uh, final channel. And these are bar graphs that are configured in dB, and so they show the level of the signal that's there. Then down below at the bottom we have the averaging control, so I can, I can uh, average the spectrum and make it more stable, or I can let it change very uh, rapidly, and this is just the filtering through time of the power output of the individual bands in the filter bank. And then this is just an arbitrary level display uh, shift. And so this will generate a sine wave. So this is going to bring up the amplitude of the sine wave that's in the uh, going into the input of the filter bank. And now I can move the frequency up and down. And so you see that even though it's a single pure tone, it excites primarily one of the filters, but it secondarily excites the other filters because it does have um, a roll-off associated with it. So the filter is not ideal. And so you always get these bands of energy in the spectrum, and you can control how much of that is there by the spacing and the uh, order of the filter. So this is uh, a basic spectrum analyzer made using a constant Q filter bank, which conforms to the nature of hearing uh, the nature of hearing is constant Q to a first approximation over most of the spectrum. The port -to control can be easily illustrated. If I crank up the port -to mento then I get a slower transition in frequency. So it's very quick and easy to get the idea of port -to mento across. We'll leave it on pretty fast. So this is illustrating how to make a spectrum analyzer using a filter bank. And this is in a course on filters, and so it's a good way to uh, set up a display and also talk about how you make that display out of, out of filters. Uh, and this just gets the idea across initially. Empty it down. Okay, here is the software listing for the demonstration of the sinusoidal oscillator going into a filter bank. And it's very short because it makes use of demos that are already defined in the oscillator and filter libraries distributed with Faust. So we have um, this process statement here, which is that the uh, process function is defined as the oscillator library um, oscillator um, RS, which means R is for rotating phaser, S is the sinusoidal output. And so there's a demo already there for that. That gives us a little GUI for the uh, amplitude and frequency and we feed that to the spectral level demo in filter.lib. It's the nth octave spectral level demo, and it wants a argument, an argument bands per octave, which we've set to two. Um, more typical would be a third octave filter bank, but that was too big to fit on my screen. So I just uh, changed it to a half octave uh, filter bank, and it fit nicely. And then it has a mono output, which we feed to stereo. Uh, for, for listening to it. So that's that's how simple the program is. Of course, when we get into the code, um, it'll be a few more lines, but not too many. It's a, a very compact, high-level language. Okay, this is a demonstration of driving a variable filter using an, a sawtooth oscillator, where we actually have three different variable filters. Down at the bottom, we have a spectral level meter made out of a filter bank with power outputs measured and filtered for display as in the previous demonstration. We've got the same level averaging time control and overall offset control down here. So instead of a sine wave, we're going to drive this with a sawtooth. And so here's the amplitude control. So I can bring it up. 
So you see we have a broader spectrum here. I can wave the frequency around. Let's crank up the amplitude. Let's bypass the uh, filter so we don't have that effect going on. So here's just the sawtooth. You hear the portamento control. Another common thing that's done in these kinds of oscillators, these are virtual analog oscillators, is detuning. So you have three oscillators, one right on the frequency you request, and then two that are detuned. These can give you the uh, classic sounds of loosely tracking oscillators. So now, let's illustrate the filters. The sawtooth is chosen because it has a rich spectrum, and we can open the bandwidth up um, and, and close it down using these variable filters, uh, whereas a sine wave would just get louder and softer if we filtered it in any way. So now let's look at the wah parameter. We'll kick in the wah. So that's the wah pedal that many guitar players have. This is actually a digitization of the Crybaby wah pedal. And so it's a classic staple in any guitar player's uh, closet or garage or whatever he takes with him. So now let's go to the next one, uh, bypass the, the Crybaby and go to a, just a fourth order wah, put up the amplitude, and then open it up. So this is fourth order, so we'll look at the difference between second order and third, fourth order filters. The second order case is the crybaby. It's only a single uh, pull pair resonator. And then another very famous fourth order case is the Moog VCF. And so this is the one that synthesizer players mostly use. It's a fourth order uh, Moog ladder circuit, very classic circuit, but we can implement it in the same way as this fourth order wah with two bike wide sections and uh, there are actually three implementations here for comparison. So let's take a look. So that's more like a synthesizer where you've got a sawtooth and a voltage controlled filter. VCF is a voltage controlled filter. This used to be analog controlled by voltages and Moog uh, developed the, uh, the first classic circuit that's widely used. So I can bypass this and hear the original. Uh, I can implement it using biquads, and I can implement it using normalized ladder filters. And the difference there is whether or not it has artifacts when you rapidly transition it. And this is uh, demonstrated in the uh, Linux Audio Conference 2012 talk, so uh, I won't belabor it here. But it's a very important feature of these normalized ladder filters that you can move the frequency instantaneously and not get a pop other than what it uh, naturally uh, has to do in the sense that the, the energy is normalized in these filters so the, uh, the coefficient energy does not couple into the signal energy. You can arbitrarily modulate these filters even at audio rates without getting artifacts. Oh and then I should illustrate another thing. This is another nice thing for the classroom being able to illustrate what corner resonance means in one of these filters and that is to uh, uh, bring up the amplitude and raise the resonance. So now it whistles. And down here you can see in the uh, display what it means. When I raise the corner frequency, the resonance, you see more edge resonance at the edge of the low pass. Nominally, it's a low-pass filter, so you see here in the spectral display that the uh, spectrum is low-pass, and if I sweep it around, we also have nothing uh, from DC to the fundamental. If I take the fundamental way down, I can fill that in. You get some very fat sounds out of these uh, sawtooth, uh, filtered sawtooth waveforms. Classic sounds. Here now is the listing 
of that previous demo of the sawtooth going into the crybaby and the fourth order wah, which is basically a fourth order low pass, and the Moog VCF, another fourth order low pass, and finally the uh, spectral level demo. <clears throat> uh, these are all in series, as shown by the colon operator there, and the output is panned out, or rather distributed out into stereo. And the uh, grouping is ordered with these uh, numbers in the strings. Okay, and uh, these are all in the library. So this this actually is an example distributed with the Faust distribution called VCF WA pedals DSP. So that was a particularly easy one. Um, and then the purpose is just to demonstrate the effects and get an idea of what they do. And then we dive in into learning how to make them from scratch. This illustrates how I compiled those demos. I used the script Faust to Core Audio QT uh, that distributes with the Faust uh, distribution, and I gave it the uh, example that's in the examples directory, vcfwapedals.dsp, and it created an application that I can then open using the open command, and that's how we got things going in the previous demos. Now I want to do something slightly different, which is to use uh, Faust to Jack QT, and I want to compile the ZetaRev demo. And the reason I want to use Jack is because I want to test it with a separate standalone application called the Reverb Tester. So let's look at that. Okay, this is an illustration of using two applications connected together through Jack. So I have a stereo reverb tester, which just puts out an impulse in the middle or the left or the right channels. And you can also listen to the uh, external microphones. You can also drive your system with pink noise if you want to hear that. And then what we're uh, driving is uh, the Zeta reverberator, Zeta Rev 1. So it has an input delay, a low frequency, transition frequency. You can set the uh, decay time, the time to decay 60 dB or T60 in three channels, or two lows, mids, and then there's a special high frequency channel that uh, has a damping control. And then there's some equalization, <clears throat> dry wet mix, overall level, and it's a very nice rich reverberator written in Faust. And so here's how we connect them up. Um, we run Jack Pilot or some other Jack client, and you see that I've got the server running, so Jack is running the Jack Audio Connection Kit. And so the routing button brings up this panel where I can connect things. So I can say, let's have the reverb tester uh, drive uh, Zeta Reb. So I can double click on that and it uh, makes those two connections. It automatically connects uh, any number of channels when you do that. So now we're ready to try it out. Let's give it an impulse. Okay, this is a classic example of the flip classroom where I get into a place in a demo where something doesn't work or I'm live coding and something doesn't work and I appeal to the class what's wrong? Why don't I get any sound? Why am I getting no sound out of this example? Um, and uh, it really wakes them up. It really gets them engaged. They participate. They pay attention. They come up with ideas. And very soon, very quickly, somebody would say you did not hook up the output. So I connected the uh, reverb tester to Zeta Rev 1 but I never connected Zeta Rev 1 to the system. So let me do that now. Double click. So now Zeta Rev 1 outputs go to playback 1 and 2. Reverb tester out go to Zeta Rev um, in 0 and in 1. And uh, that's all we need. So now we should get some sound. Very nice reverberator. Okay, so that was, that was some examples of the uh, standalone applications used in class. Now I would like to talk a little bit about the live coding uh, activity. This is, I think, my number one favorite activity for flipped classrooms nowadays. So the lectures are recorded, everything's written in the book, and when we get into class, we're completely free to do whatever adds the most value. And I tend to measure that in terms of student engagement. So what really gets their attention? What gets them participating and, and uh, really awake and galvanized for the class? Okay, this is a live coding example um, in Faust for the BiQuad. BiQuad 
meaning biquadratic uh, transfer function. So it has a second order numerator, second order denominator, denominator, and so one of the great things about programming in Faust is that you can put the statements in a new order so you can make it look just how you want. Um, so we can just say process equals bicod and fill, fill things in. From there, you get to go in uh, steps that you want. Now, how are we going to test this? I think, you know, we probably want to see its impulse response. So we can create an impulse by taking the constant 1 and subtracting the constant 1 delayed 1 sample. That'll give us a nice input uh, impulse for the biquad. And so now we can define what the biquad is. So it's going to be uh, an FIR part uh, followed by an IIR part, and we can interchange them. One of the things we can show is that um, you can commute the FIR part and the IIR part and have the same filter. Linear time invariant systems are com commutative. So that's uh, the breakdown there. And then the FIR part is um, a you know uh, moving average filter, second order. So one way to specify it, there are many ways to specify it. Uh, we could specify it as x, well, we have a coefficient b0 times x, and then we'll have a coefficient b1 times x delayed one sample, and then uh, one more for second order, so x delayed twice. is uh, That's the FIR part, or moving average part, and so we'll set those coefficients later. Now the IIR part is a little more tricky, so um, you know, so this is feedback, right? So um, this is where I have to teach them a little bit about the Faust syntax and how it works. So we'll have a, a summer that takes um, an input signal and then feeds back through um, the feedback coefficients, and so now we get a delay from the feedback. So the feedback has already one delay in it. And so we can multiply by minus a1. That's just the sign convention to make it minus a1. And then for the other one, we want to uh, have um, minus a2. But we're going to have to add another delay ourselves. So we'll have a mem feeding into minus a2 there. And now how do I uh, create two signal paths there? Well, I have to take this feedback. I only want one delay here, and I want to then expand it out to uh, two channels, and then I one of them gets multiplied by minus a1, the other one gets delayed once and multiplied by minus a2, and then uh, finally we uh, add those together to get the feedback signal that then comes around to the input of the uh, summer, and uh, maybe that works. And so now let's define our filter coefficients. So the numerator coefficients. Um, Let's suppose we want a low-pass filter so that we want both of our zeros at half the sampling rate. So uh, let's put in the uh, polynomial for that. So that, um, oh wait, that would be 1, 2, 1. So 1 plus 2z inverse plus z to the minus 2 has two zeros at z equals minus 1. Two zeros at z equals uh, minus 1. And then for the poles, we, we normally have a polar representation. So we'll normally have uh, a1 equal to minus 2 times r times cosine theta, where r is the pole radius and theta is the pole angle. A2 is also easily specified in terms of the pole radius. And so that's just a very typical definition. And then we can give the, uh, the details of that. So R, the damping, is e to the minus bandwidth times the sampling period, uh, e to the minus, oh, and times pi. And to get pi defined, well, we could define it ourselves with arctan. But let's just go ahead and uh, import music.lib, which defines pi for us. Uh, so that'll be defined now. So then we also have now theta, our angle, which is 2 times pi times uh, the frequency we want times t. And so t is 1 over the sampling rate. 
And the sampling rate, let's just pick it to be 144, 100. That's typical on my computer. And uh, we need to pick a uh, we need to pick a, a frequency and a bandwidth. So finally, we can get very specific and say we want our bandwidth to be, well, I don't know, let's say 100 hertz or uh, so, and then we'll have the uh, frequency be, uh, let's put it right in the middle of the visible spectrum. So at FS over 4, we'll have a, a centered uh, resonance there. But we call this a low-pass filter. We set the zeros to get a low-pass filter. So we have, uh, we have you know, a, a pass band, and then we'll have a resonance at a quarter of the same rate, and then it'll go down to zero at high frequencies. So let's see where we are here. Um, I also like to just show my workflow in Emacs. I feel like that's a good thing for the students to know about. And I'm just covering this down so it all fits on one page. And now I'm going to get a shell, and uh, let's, let's see if it compiles at all. Um, so we, we first try to compile A miracle, it compiles. And now we will, let's say, let's look at the uh, black diagram. I have a, uh, a Faust of Firefox alias, uh, F2FF. And so I say Faust of Firefox B.DSP. And there it is. So there is our constant, and then the constant delayed, subtracted to form a, an impulse, 10000. And now we go into the by quad. And so what we name tends to be its own block diagram. Uh, let's blow this up. So we have um, the by quad, and the by quad is defined as its FIR part flowing to its IIR part. The FAR part is uh, uh, the, the simple case of uh, a moving average. So the signal X comes in, the undelayed X gets multiplied by, uh oh, that should be uh, B, B0. B0 should be multiplying, um, uh, let's see, that's just a name thing, isn't it? Oh, well, B0 and B2 are, are the same, so that's okay. <clears throat> they just happen to be bound to one. So this is actually B0, and so X comes in uh, multiply, uh, added to two times X delayed and added to X twice delayed. All right, so that's the FIR part. looks right, and it's good. Now, the IR part we're more worried about because it's got feedback. So here's our summer, and here's our feedback. There's our delay that we got from the feedback, and here's the uh, straight through. Uh, minus A1 is the coefficient that comes into the summer just fine. And then minus A2 uh, times the delayed feedback, the mem gives us another delay, and that's our A2 coefficient, and that comes in the summer. And that looks fine. So when you look at this black diagram, you think, no, nah, it's got to work. All right, so let's see. So back to the uh, uh, command line. This is a shell within Emacs. So now I'm going to run Faust 2 octave on um, b.dsp because I want to show you uh, the, the really nice way of looking at things that are, you know, filters. You can see them in the frequency domain. So now I can see what I've got here. I've got a Faust out. I can plot it. Uh, plot Faust out. That's the output. It's actually any number of signals. So if you had multiple output signals, they'll all be overlaid. And then where it is, here it is. So there's my impulse response. It's ringing like it should. That's good. And now I have a little alias. Um, called, you know, plot the, well, <clears throat> it, it's a frequency domain view, and it gives me a log log plot for, you know, the, the default, and it also will give me um, a linear scale if I want to look at that, and so this, this allows us to look at it, and look at, lo and behold, it is a low pass filter that's got a pass band, 0 dB gain, well, plus something, uh, it's a, it's a flat pass band. It's not normalized to 0 dB yet. And then we've got our resonance. You know, our um, 100 hertz bandwidth is kicking in here. And then we have our zeros at half the sampling rate. So it's qualitatively what we expect. And this is a more audio-oriented uh, scale where you can see the pass band, the resonance at cor the corner, and then the roll-off, rapid roll-off. So that is a live coding example for a uh, practical signal processing element called the biquad, configured as a low pass filter. Now I can go quickly configure it as a high pass filter by just moving these zeros from half the sampling rate down to DC. And we can configure it as a band pass by just putting one zero at DC and one zero at half the sampling rate. And so those are the classic low pass, band pass, and high pass outputs that you see in these uh, you know, first or second order um, uh, cases. There's, the state variable filter uh, is an example of that. That's just another name for this kind of thing. So that is a live coding example in, you know, complete with
Okay, so now we uh, have the last third case, which is uh, the reference implementation. So you've already seen some examples of uh, input from um, the oscillator library, the filter library, the effects library. And I would refer you to the uh, Linux Audio Conference uh, paper for an overview of that. That's still on the web. You can uh, download the talk and the, uh, uh, the video and so on. Um, so all I'll say about it right now is that um, it's nice to have reference implementations in any field that make it very quick and easy to uh, get things working, uh, things that are already known. You don't want to really have to necessarily pull a paper and type it in yourself and debug it. You want just working code, right? <clears throat> so we should all be contributing to such, such efforts. So the fact that Faust compiles to C++, uh, which is probably arguably the number one language in the world these days, and ports immediately to a wide variety of host environments, like various types of plug-in and standalone uh, applications, makes it an, an excellent choice. And it's also a very nice high-level language. It's very readable, and uh, it's fun to write. Everything's really small and tight and uh, elegant. And it generates very well-optimized code. Um, I've been using it in uh, app development and uh, really have not been able to beat it, really. In other words, I've tried writing a few things in C++, but I keep coming back to Faust. It's just such a better representation, and the, um, and the efficiency is really, really good. So um, it just keeps winning as the uh, main language. And maybe, uh, maybe I should show you a little bit of that. Uh, so I just want to conclude by saying that the uh, experience to date indicates that the in-class demonstrations are useful to just sort of set the stage and let this class know what, what we're about to talk about and, and it's fun, useful stuff. The live coding is, is an excellent class experience for flipped classrooms where the lectures are all pre-recorded, the book is all written, everything's there, and really you can do anything you want in the classroom. And we are open to anything in the class, but the live coding examples are the leading example of uh, an activity that engages the class, gets them going, gets them contributing, uh, I'm just really pleased with it. It's the most active and engaged classroom experience I've ever been able to generate. I, I'm not the world's greatest teacher. Uh, I tend to just kind of spew things in fire in fire hose mode, but uh, um, this is getting my classroom engaged uh, in a way that is better than ever. So real-time demonstrations and live coding are, uh, are, are really good uses of a flipped classroom in my experience. And then finally, the reference Im implementations are useful for practical development, and that's both for their project work that they're all doing, most of them are doing, and also after they graduate and are trying to do things in the world, it's just nice to have things they can start with, get things going. So I guess I'll close with a quick demo of this app that I'm working on. Uh, okay, this is GeoShred. It is a an app for the iPad that is uh, based on a physical model. So in particular, you can get in here and uh, configure the guitar. So this is a guitar implemented in Faust. It's got uh, various string controls. It's got various body controls. You can even uh, um, get some resonances and, and configure those in various ways. Um, then there are some nonlinear bridge features, another feature of the physical modeling approach, um, all implemented in Faust. And then in addition to the guitar, there are these uh, effects. And these are also all written in Faust, so various uh, distortion units um, digitized from classic schematics. The uh, four octave equalizer, uh, which is convenient. Um, echo unit, simple delay line. Um, chorus unit, and, uh, and so on. There are quite a few effects. Um, and so all this stuff runs just fine in real time, even on the iPad 2. I'm, I'm running uh, the iPad 2 simulator here, and we're trying to keep it running on, on that. Okay, here's a performance by somebody who can actually play it. Mm -hmm.